Welcome to Evolution Debunked, where we refute the strongest arguments for evolution and present some of the best evidence for creation. Today's show, Richard Dawkins and One Fact to Refute Creationism. In this video, posted on Fora TV in October of 2009, Richard Dawkins presents what he considers the strongest single fact against creation. Let's take a look. Do you think there could be one sentence that could convince, um, let's say, a creationist to seriously doubt their theory? Ideally, if you could convince a believer in God to really doubt their belief, but that's too hard. Not sure about a, about a sentence. I think perhaps the single most convincing fact, the observation that you could point to would be the, um, the pattern of resemblances that you see when you compare the genes using modern DNA techniques, actually looking at the letter-to-letter -letter correspondences between genes. Compare the genes of any pair of animals you like, a uh, pair of animals, pair of plants, and then plot out the resemblances and they fall on a perfect hierarchy, a perfect family tree. Dawkins points to genetic similarities between various life forms as the best proof of evolution. He suggests that these similarities can be plotted into a perfect hierarchy or family tree, but that is a gross oversimplification. The evolutionary tree, which originally looked like this, has been evolving itself as new genetic analysis is completed. Evolutionary theory used to state that one organism was at the base of the tree and that all life descended from there. However, new genetic evidence has caused revisions. Now there is a supposed group or community of cells at the root of the tree, and the different trunks of the tree are theorized to transfer genes to each other laterally. The reason for this change, quite simply, is that the genetic data did not match the evolutionary predictions. Organisms that evolutionists didn't think were closely related shared more genes than expected, and vice versa. Quoting the Journal of Science, There's so much lateral transfer that even the concept of the tree is debatable. Or, from Scientific American, it's as if we have failed at the task that Darwin set for us, delineating the unique structures of the tree of life. It seems Darwin's refutational evidence isn't as strong as he would lead us to believe. One example of an exception to Dawkins' tree of life is the relationship between horses and bats. Evolutionists classify organisms based on similarities in two areas, anatomy and genetics. The theory of common descent postulates that animals with more physical similarities are more closely related than animals with fewer physical similarities. In addition, those that look alike physically and are therefore more closely related from an evolutionary perspective should share more genetic similarities. However, horses are more genetically similar to bats than they are to cows. Again, the whole idea of common descent is that animals with more anatomical similarities would also share more genetic similarities. In this case, it's a big swing and a miss. Exceptions like this are what led to the revision of the tree of life. The evolutionary tree of life, now that actual observational data is coming in, is starting to look more and more like the creationist orchard. The orchard postulates that distinct kinds of animals were created, which could then adapt to their environment and lead to new species within the kind. But there were boundaries to this adaptation, which is exactly what we observe in the laboratory. So, Dawkins points to what amounts to a failed prediction as the ultimate refutation of creationism. The reason that this is even possible is that evolution is such a slippery theory that any new data, no matter how contrary to previous predictions, can be made to fit. The only true requirement is a philosophical bias towards naturalism. It is amazing how well evidence fits evolutionary theory once that theory is massaged and molded to fit each new contradictory discovery. Let's get back to Dawkins. And the only alternative to it being a family tree is that the intelligent designer deliberately set out to deceive us in the most underhand and devious manner. Um. Here Dawkins mocks the interpretation of common genes pointing to a common designer and instead suggests that such commonality would only exist if God were intentionally trying to deceive us into thinking that all animals had a common ancestor. But again, does this make any sense? If all animals had a common designer, wouldn't they logically share common design patterns? And if they shared common design patterns, wouldn't the DNA, which is the instructions used to assemble these biological parts, have similarities as well? 
This is consistent with observations in the real world. A car manufacturer, for instance, would have common design features among its various models. Does the fact that all BMWs have a kidney grill mean that the German engineers want to deceive us into thinking that their cars all came into being naturally, one model evolving into the next? Of course not. Common genes make more sense when viewed as evidence for a common designer. If a particular design works well, such as the common arm structure including a hinge at the elbow and individual digits at the end, a designer would logically reuse that design in multiple situations. Listen, I don't dispute that Richard Dawkins is an incredibly smart man, but to me, this entire argument misses the forest for the trees. Genetics in general is a big problem for evolution and any naturalistic explanation of origins. The information within DNA is actually a language unto itself. And like the transmission of information in any language, there must also be a receiver to interpret and process the information. In the case of DNA, there exist complex decoding mechanisms in the ribosome. The truly astonishing thing is that the instructions for these decoding mechanisms actually exist within the DNA as well. Now, language and information are immaterial concepts. It is not logical to believe that a natural process can result in language. And DNA is a self-contained language complete with instructions for creating mechanisms to translate itself. That means DNA is meaningless without DNA, and that DNA can't exist without DNA. From an evolutionary standpoint, it is impossible to imagine how random processes could evolve not only a functional language capable of conveying complex biological blueprints, but also the directions for decoding it, all at the same time. It truly is a chicken and egg problem. Sir Karl Popper describes it as follows. Thus, the code cannot be translated except by using certain products of its translation. This constitutes a baffling circle, a really vicious circle, it seems, for any attempt to form a model or theory of the genesis of the genetic code. Genetic similarities between organisms are actually not a problem for creationists at all. A common designer explains the evidence even better than a common ancestor once the many exceptions to the evolutionary tree are properly understood. In fact, evolutionists have a hard time even explaining how the genetic code could have arisen to begin with. Is this really the best evidence to refute creation? More, moreover, the same thing works with, with every gene you do separately and even pseudogenes that don't do anything but are vestigial relics of genes that once, that once did something. Ah, the old vestigial organs argument applied to DNA. You have to give evolutionists credit for persistence. Time and again, organs that evolutionists assumed were vestigial had been found to have a purpose. Because we can't see or readily understand the function of an organ, we assume that it is therefore useless? Completely undeterred by their track record with this line of thinking, Evolutionists applied it to genetics by asserting that DNA, which doesn't directly code for proteins, is junk DNA. Yet, already scientists have begun to discover that much of this junk DNA does indeed have a purpose, such as gene regulation, for instance. Evolutionists love to say that creationists believe in a god of the gaps, meaning anything they don't understand they simply credit to God. Further, they say this is damaging to science because it discourages scientific pursuit to find answers for things we have yet to learn. In reality, it is evolution that is hurting scientific pursuit, with decades of vestigial organ and junk DNA claims causing well-meaning scientists to ignore entire systems as well as sections of DNA. Evolutionists were essentially saying, if we don't understand it, it doesn't have a purpose. It should be noted that Dawkins has started backing away from junk DNA discussion since the results of the ENCODE project showed that most, if not all, of this junk DNA absolutely has a purpose. Last week, six days ago, the result of 1,600 experiments by 450 scientists in 32 different institutions discovered that actually that 98% that people thought was junk isn't junk at all. It's absolutely essential for the maintenance of life. Fascinating fact that the chief rabbi has the, ev the evidence he's given that um, whereas we thought that only a minority of the the genome was doing something, namely that minority which actually codes for protein. Um, uh, and, and now we find that, that actually the majority of it's doing something. But what the point is, that that was just the subroutines that are called into being. The program that's calling them into action is, is, the, is the, the rest which had previously been written off as junk. I have noticed that there are some creationists who are jumping on it because they think that's awkward for Darwinism. 
Um, quite the contrary, of course. It's exactly what a Darwinist would hope for. Dawkins can't have it both ways. Before junk DNA was shown to have function, he used junk DNA as evidence for evolution and against creation. Now that junk DNA is shown to have important function, he claims that evolution would have anticipated this all along. Apart from being extremely intellectually dishonest, this once again proves that evolution is a malleable framework that can explain any evidence, even if it's self-contradictory. It's also important to point out that the creation model successfully predicted that junk DNA actually had function. Successful predictions are said to be the fruits of a good scientific theory. Yet when the creation model offers successful predictions, which happens much more often than most people know, the issue is simply swept under the rug and evolution is retroactively claimed to have made the prediction. This claim is debunked and the evidence is much better explained by the creation model. Thanks for watching this episode of Evolution Debunked. Please subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes.